OK. So uh, yeah, so this is the usual uh, cartoon, cartoon version, uh, cartoon story that we talk about. But in practice, we know that this is not entirely true, because ever since uh, in, in the early days of the twister string theory, we know that you actually do have theories which have a world sheet, but there's no infinite excitation. It's just the usual field theory, high energy behavior. And more, more uh, recently, uh, as you've all heard from uh, uh, Song's talk, that there's now another formulation of scattering equations, which are, is an, uh, another world sheet theory, which I put quotation mark on theory because it's a theory, it's, it's, it's a formulation which you compute amplitudes, but uh, we would like to understand what is the origin be like. For example, what it is it quantizing? Is it really a string that's being quantizing? What gives these formula? So in other words, the question that we want to ask today is that, okay, we already have a world sheet here to describe string theory that excite all these conventional infinite excitations. Uh, but is there an interpolation between this kind of world sheet that tells you it's a string and another world sheet that tells you it's a particle? So is there a smooth interpolation between these two limits? Uh, so of course, we already know how to get field theory out of string theory. There's two limits we can try to do. First is we can take the alpha prime to zero limit, which is the infinite tension limit of string theory. But then we lose the world sheet. Because in that limit, the, whole, the, the, the string now essentially, the world sheet is essentially collapsed into a world line. And this is precisely the early days work of Bern, Kossauer, and Nair, where they consider tree level amplitudes computed from string theory by taking alpha prime to zero. Of course, the, the, this is actually a, a good way of looking at field theory amplitudes, because now, instead of looking at all these different Feynman diagrams, you really just have one object, which is the world line with different insertions. But still, there's no world sheet here. And you can do another limit, which is just take the alpha prime to infinity limit. But this is usually a, well, a less understood limit, because naively what you would say is that you go to that limit, then all the infinite excitations suddenly all collapse to zero mass. And then you have inf infinite uh, masses in, uh, interactions. But as you all know, that higher spin uh, masses interaction is not well understood. There's general unitarity problems. And so this limit is not very uh, well understood. This might not even be a field theory. But yet, if you take this limit, uh, interestingly, you see that the scattering equations come out, which was discussed. Uh, and because in, in this limit, what you see is that the world sheet integral, you still have a world sheet. The world sheet integral, you can, you can uh, approximate it by saddle point. And the saddle point is precisely the scattering equations that, uh, that uh, uh, Song talked about. OK, so this is what we know. So, but, so we would like to start from this and try to find what exactly, what kind of world sheet actually does give, world sheet theory that actually does give the particle theory. So the way that we're going to do is to first study string theory, but forget about the world sheet from string theory. So we're going we're to think about string theory not as a world sheet theory, but just from uh, the, the properties of the its scattering amplitudes. And then from this to take some hints on how to find a scattering amplitude uh, for the field theory that allows you to have a world sheet. So if I were to say, what is string theory uh, from a scattering point of view, then I would say that string theory is a particular solution to a problem where, so, so let's consider a, a scattering amplitude of Yang males, but it's ultraviolet completed. So that means that what that means is that you have an infinite number of massive states. So what characterizes string theory is that you can, so you, can, you can write your amplitude and you can put all the propagators in the denominator. Now, unitarity will tell you there's a constraint. Because you cannot, so, you, so this is, a, this is a, a function of two variables, s and t. So naively, you say, oh, I can put, there's a singularity here, and there's a singularity here. So naively, you can have uh, uh, simultaneous singularities in the, these two channels. And of course, this cannot be true, because that would mean that your theory is non-local. Because when you're sitting on a singularity, that means you're already factorizing into two three points. There could be no, no, no new singularity if the theory is local. OK, if there's any new thing singularity, that means the theory is non-local on the three-point. So that means you somehow you want to kill the double pose here. So what, how I would ca characterize string theory is that string theory s proposed solution for this killing of double pose is a particular solution where it just puts all the, the double pose as a 0 in the, denom in, in the numerator, a, a, a manifest 0. So in other words, when s is equals a i, t equals a, a j, then there's a u plus a i plus a j on the numerator, which cancels the double pole. So whenever there's a double pole, th this is how string theory cancels it. So this is how I would characterize string theory is. And uh, that doesn't use the world sheet. Because as you'll see immediately, that once I just say that I want to cancel the double poles in this way, you immediately get all the, f all the features of string theory uh, that you can get from a world sheet. 
So these zeros are necessary from the term of uni unitarity, and now it's been termed as unitarity zeros. Uh, and you, you'll hear more of this in Zohar's talk uh, tomorrow. So, um, so let's see how this directly leads you to string theory. So, okay, so we have this function that looks like this. So, of course, we know that there's a massless pole in front. So when, when we sit on this massless pole, we know there's only two kinds of three-point interaction coming from f, f squared and f4. Oh, sorry, this should be f cubed. So from f cubed. And so that means that on the residue, it, it has a very unique form. This amplitude should have a very unique form. This is just from massless interaction, because we all know that massless interactions are highly constrained. So that means that if you look at this function, you sit on its, its zero residue, the, the function takes this form. It looks very far from the form that I have up here, which is, which is what we must get. So that means that all these, all these rational terms must cancel completely. So the fact that these two, that these must cancel, tells you that there's two solutions, uh, there's two, two possible solutions, uh, depending on whether beta is zero or non-zero. In other words, whether or not there's a f, f cube. If beta is zero, then th you should just get this object, and this must cancel completely. Then this means that each combination must have something in the denominator to cancel. So that means that ai plus aj must be equal to something in the denominator. And you can see that if you, if you think a little bit about it, then you see that this equation has only one solution, and that's positive integers. So you are immediately you get string theory. You get the, 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 the integer space spectrum, and this, and this gives you actually the super string. Now, if beta is not equal to zero, then you have to think a little bit, because then you have this extra term over here. And just thinking a little bit, uh, uh, this extra term means that there, there's actually a term that doesn't have a t-channel pole. So that means that there's an excess of zeros up here, which you want, you want to cancel by something in the denominator. And that actually forces you that there must be a tachyon. In other words, once you set up your equation that looks like this, then the very presence of an f cube operator tells you that you must have a tachyon. Okay, so this is why I say that if, 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 I, if, you, if you ask me what is string theory, I'll say that the string theory is that it, it gives, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a, a, an answer which gives this as your solution to the unitarity problem. And just by starting with this answer, you immediately get, immediately get the two string theory answers. So in other words, the two answers I just present before is precisely the yang mills amplitude of superstring as well as the bosonic uh, uh, string amplitude, depending on whether or not you have that f cube uh, interaction in the masses uh, region. So let me move on to closed string, which means I want gravity. And as you, as you, as you expect, that I can just ex do immediately the same thing. I just put everything on the denominator, and I just put, again, the string theory is, what string theory means is that the way it's killing double poles ha have explicit zeros in the numerator. And then I do exactly the same uh, uh, argument before. Then I can see that uh, the, the, the constraining of the massless residue, then, so now I'm just going to talk about the superstring. Then the mean forces that all these, inter all these uh, A coefficients, which, which denotes the spectrum, is integer. And I immediately get uh, the closed string, superstring amplitude. And actually, thinking of it, about this in this way ha has a very nice feature, because I can stare at this and I compare it with, uh, stare at this uh, factorized form and compare with the previous uh, open string form, which uh, I have here. Then you can see that the closed string form, actually, you can, you can separate into two pieces, which are the, the open string, plus multiply by this polynomial in t. This polynomial has zeros at both integer and negative, uh, in all integer positions. And since this is just a single value function, with, so that means that the, the determination of all its zero determine what this function is, just a sine function. And so you, get, you immediately see that the closed string amplitude is actually the, the product of two open string multiplied by the sine function, which was derived uh, in, uh, before um, by uh, Kawaii and Henry Tai and Luan through uh, Worosi monodromy relations. But you see that just by studying the zeros, that the structure of your zeros and your poles, you immediately also get this relation directly without through the world sheet. OK, so this is my understanding of string theory, which is looking at the, it's the it's zeros and poles. So now I will show you that how does zeros and poles show us a path through a world sheet theory, a field theory. So if I, if I uh, just, so this is, this is a diagram. So I'm, I'm going to consider closed string, OK? So, I'm going to, so this is also why I derived this equation before, because I'm going to use it here. So I know my closed string amplitude is written in terms of products of two open strings. So now I'm going to stare at the positions of poles and zeros of this open string. 
OK, so this, so there's, so this is two, three axes of the three kinematic invariants. Of course, they're not independent, but I'm just going to treat them independent for now for illustration purpose. So this is the S-channel axis. This is the positive, and this is the positive T-channel axis, and this is the positive U-channel axis. So for this open string amplitude on your left-hand side, wait, no, right-hand side, sorry, <laughs> on your right-hand side, so you see that there's poles in the S-channel and poles in the T-channel. But it has zeros in the U channel, okay? And you have poles in, and on the on the left hand side you have the poles on the U channel and T channel and zeros on the U channel. So of course this is perfectly reasonable because all these zeros are supposed to be there to cancel all these double poles here, and all these zeros are canceling the double poles here. So this is fine. Now I'm going to but just staring at this, you'll notice something, which is if I just flip. So I'm flipping this side. So by flipping, I mean, I mean, what I mean is I'm flipping the signature. So I'm putting S to U to negative S, negative T, negative U. Then the position of the pose and zero now flips into this form. So now the zeros, which was originally in the negative U channel, now becomes in the positive U channel. And, uh, and then you have uh, T channel pose in the negative T region and S channel pose in the negative S region. So why is this interesting? Because you'll notice that if I combine these two diagrams together, the zeros over here cancels completely all the poles over here, right? And the zeros over here on the U, negative U channels cancels, uh, positive U channel cancels all the zeros over here, or all the poles over here. So that means that all the, all the massive poles that was originally in your theory is now completely canceled. You'll say that, oh wait, but I have all these, uh, these poles on the T channel axis from negative t to positive t, but remember that there's a, actually a sine function here which has zeros in both negative and positive t. So in, in other words, to just doing this simple flip, you get, you cancel all the physical poles, uh, all the massive poles. Y you don't cancel everything because zero itself is not a, because the, the, the region is not, uh, does not contain any zero. So that means you actually, in the, in the end of the day, once you do this flipping, you can just go through, this is just simple uh, identities of gamma functions. You see that in the end of the day, just by flipping one side, you get a function which is 1 over STU, which after the multiplying the prefactor, that gives you the gravity amplitude, the supergravity amplitude, more precisely. So just by doing this flip, you get field theory amplitude. Uh, you can do the same thing for the bosonic string, which you have now, so, the, so now you have two sides again, but the, the, the only difference is now you have this extra tachyon, uh, pole, a tachyon pole here. So after doing this flip, uh, so you see you have most of the uh, massive uh, poles also canceled that away, except that you have this left behind uh, massive pole. So now the original tachyon pole now becomes a tachyon and a spin and, and a massive uh, degree of freedom. So for the bosonic string, what you will get is you will get a, 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 as you still get a tachyon, the massive degrees of freedom, and one single massive excitation state. Okay. So, of course, you can do this for any closed string theory. So just at the four points, so, the, so for example, we already seen that for the, for the maximal super, uh, for the type 2 or the type 2A or type 2B, you, you, once you do this, you get actually supergravity, 2A and 2B supergravity. Uh, uh, and for the heterotic string, what you get is you get the, t the, the type 1 supergravity. Now, of course, because remember when we were doing, when we're, we're always doing this in this KLT format, so that means that when you're flipping, when I'm considering heterotic string, one side is going to be uh, a bosonic string. So that means you're going to get one of the massive modes. So now for the heterotic string, they'll make a difference. Okay, well, okay. They'll make a difference between whether you're flipping the heterotic part, uh, the super part, or the bosonic part. So that means the heterotic, uh, for the heterotic string, you'll get either a tachyon ghost, which, is, which it means that if you're flipping the, the bosonic part, or just a simple massive spin two states. In other words, once you do it for the heterotic thing, what you get is you get just the usual Einstein gravity coupled to a, spin two ma a massive spin two state. So I'll make some comments at the, in the end. And of course, for the bosonic string, you get the tachyon ghost and the massive spin two state. Then you get them both. OK, so uh, since I think I'm not going to get this done in 10 minutes. So this is a, so, so of course, I, I, was, I, was, I was illustrating uh, this example using just the four-point amplitude. But the, but the important fact is, of course, that this is actually true for arbitrary point. And so there, there's just some, uh, uh, basically a sketch of the derivation. So I'm, I'm just going to skip this derivation over here. Just to comment that uh, now, uh, the, the, it just, 
the, the, we essentially have a proof that this actually doing this operation of flipping actually gives you the correct uh, uh, supergravity uh, super gravity amplitudes to, uh, to arbitrary point. Okay, but I'm, I was ta really talking about the world sheet, so do, do, we, do I actually have a world sheet theory that describes this? So, but because of, I identified that well, all I'm doing is just this flipping, so actually, yes, I do, I do have a world sheet theory. And so you can just consider just this simple uh, formulation, which you, uh, formula for the, I'm just considering the tachyon amplitude, just for now, for simplicity, so I don't have to deal with uh, polarization vectors. So we, we have the usual tachyon amplitude in the closed string sector, and of course I can write it in terms of left-handed and right-handed mode, because I'm going to do the flipping on one side. So by, as you see, we're doing, when I'm flipping, I'm flipping the sign, the signature, of the kinematic invariance. So that means the transformation is that what I claim is a supergravity amplitude is essentially this integral where this side of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the signature is flipped to the minus. So it's a change of space and signature for the left-handed OPE. And just if you think about it a little bit, this is equivalent to saying that you're, we're changing the Green's function. Okay, so we know that usually our Green's, the world sheet Green function is log z, z bar. So the fact that I want a negative, a negative sign with respect to z bar and z, so that means I, all I have to do is just to add a homogeneous term uh, to my Green's function, which you can always do, right? I mean, so so you, you, when you're solving your Green's function, you have the delta function, but essentially you can always add a homogeneous term. So if you add this extra homogeneous piece, down, you get a Green's function where the left-handed part has an opposite sign with respect to the, to the right-handed part, okay? So in other words, this flipping of signature, you, can, you think of it as a trip, it has an operation on the world sheet, and that operation is you're modifying your Green, Green's function. Now, of course, you might uh, say that, wait a minute, but, what, but this is problematic, because if I, if I do this with this negative sign, then uh, my, my, world sheet, my world sheet integral is no longer single value. How am I even to think about this consistently? And of course, the, the, the answer is, well, you're not supposed to think of this uh, world sheet integrand as just a simple counter. You have to be careful about your counter in the beginning. So, of course, we know that when, we, when we're usually talking about this beta function, when th this is a usual standard string theory textbook, you write this, you, you write this world sheet integrand down, and you say it's a beta function. We all know that this is not entirely true, because this, this, the relation between these two are only valid in particular kinematic regimes, right? We know that alpha and beta have to, the real part have to be bigger than zero. Of course, we're using this function in all these different kinematic regimes. So what we're really working at is a deform uh, counter, which is what is called a Gagan, uh, uh, no, not a Gagan counter, Pockenheimer counter. Yes, the Pockenheimer counter. So what is really happening is you're really looking at a Pockenheimer counter. So these are the two marked points uh, so this will be 1 and z, uh, sorry, 0 and 1. And r the relation with the beta function is re related through this uh, product of signs. So um, I guess in light of time, I, I won't delve into this too much, but I just want to say that really in the beginning, we, what we should be doing is we should be considering a counter of this, of this kind on the world sheet anyway. So that means that this issue of, about, uh, so, this is, so this issue about the, the world sheet function uh, is no longer a single value is not an issue because you, you're supposed to deal, deal with it as a counter integral in any way. But, uh, okay, but I have an even more convincing uh, uh, argument for why this world sheet uh, theory is, is, is well defined. is because I, I, I also have an oscillator, uh, oscillator language for what's happening. So basically, essentially what's happening is you're, you're, you're redefining the vacuum. So you, uh, what you're actually doing is, if you want to change the, I mean, it's simple, right? I mean, all you're doing is you're, the left-handed modes, the, the commutator algebra, you're adding an extra not minus sign. So what that means is that you're just exchanging the, the, the doing a linear recombination of what you mean by uh, annihilation operator and excitation operator. So you're just doing a transformation, which is just a Bogliobo transformation. And on the various solar generators, what happens is that you get an extra minus sign because of this uh, extra minus sign here you get the extra minus sign on your bar. So the usual L0 plus L0 bar, where our now bar condition to be zero now, which originally will give you the, the levels of your mass, the mat relation to it, the mass level relation, now becomes a constraint on your level. So M plus M bar has to be equals to two because of the split, flip. And, and originally the, 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 the level matching condi condition now becomes telling you what the mass is. So these two, the row of these two conditions is actually flipped. And for example, for the bosonic string, by satisfying these two conditions, you can see that uh, there's really just three different states. So this is the massless states here, 
and this was the massive spin two state that I was telling you about, and this is the tachyon state. And of course, you, you, if you work throughout this oscillator for the superstring as well, you get uh, 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 you get uh, um, the super string, uh, the, the super gravity spectrum. So uh, f now, now I'm going to focus on sorry, I'm going to focus on the type two superstring and heterotic Yang mills. You can do this, and you, you, the result you obtain is precisely only the massless states. There's no massive state. So that means that it has a particular feature. The, 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 the formulation that you have has, has, has alpha prime in it. It doesn't have to be particular value. But this value is irrelevant because the, the, the final physics doesn't depend on any scale. It's completely massless. So you can take the alpha prime to infinity, which means that this should be equivalent to your some tensionless string. And indeed, this is equivalent to tensionless string. Uh, because a, a, so this is just a, a short uh, illustration why this is related. Uh, so the best way to understand what tensionless string is, is, is instead of looking at it from the, the, the Lagrangian point of view, the Roshi Lagrangian, which has this alpha prime in front, which makes taking, making it tensionless a little bit problematic. Once you look at it from a Hamiltonian point of view, then it's a, pro, it's a question of constraints. So if you look at the, Hamilt usual world, the, the Hamiltonian <coughs> point of view, uh, the, the, the Roshi Hamiltonian actually constraints of two, these two pieces. And now you see that alpha prime is sitting here. So uh, actually, there's two different constraints corresponds to the two different constraints of the Virasoro constraint I talked about before, if you look at it in terms of operators. So in the alpha prime to infinity limit, you see that, these, that this constraint actually degenerates. It degenerates into just p squared equals 0 and p dot partial 1 x. So if I look at the oscillator, I'm going to write the, my oscillator alpha n and alpha n bar in terms of pn and xn, the zero modes of p and x. Then I see I have two different in inequivalent vacuums I can define to solve this equation. The simplest one is just all the pn acting on the vacuum is zero for all n. So this is the simplest uh, version. And this is usually what we think of from in terms of the tensionless limit of, super string, uh, of string theory, because usually we think of you have alpha n and alpha n bar acting on vacuum equals zero. You take alpha prime to infinity, you think that this is the dominant p, so you want all pn acting on, on your vacuum to be zero. And this is the usual uh, tensionless limit. But instead, there's actually another solution to this, is, and, and that is pn acting on, z, on zero uh, on the vacuum, and xn acting on vacuum is zero for n bit greater than zero. And if I translate this, con this so it's, it's easy to see that this satisfies this equation. And if you translate, and this, th translate this into the oscillator language, then you see it's, it's in fact alpha n acting on a vacuum, and n tilde alpha minus n, which is alpha tilde dagger acting on the vacuum is zero. So you see, this is precisely this flip of on the on the left hand side, where I flip from alpha tilde to alpha tilde dagger. On the, so this is precisely the quantization condition that we that I discussed before in terms of this Bogliago transformation. So we see that this ten, this, this theory, if you take alpha prime to infinity, this is precisely the tensionless limit uh, superstring, except that it's actually quantized in a different vacuum than what you would naively think is the correct vacuum. Okay. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, so this, we want to relate this to superstring, uh, to, the, the, to the CHY format. And you can actually do this, because now you can take alpha prime to infinity without changing your theory. And you're just, again, doing the saddle point. And precisely because of the fact that you have an opposite sign, so that means when you're plugging in the saddle point solution, this phase factor actually cancels each other. So this alpha prime, uh, uh, so this logarithmic suppression in the usual string theory no longer happens for this. Now, uh, of course, this is relying on alpha prime to inf the alpha prime independence. So there's still an issue about bosonic gravity and heterotic gravity, which has these massive spin two states. So I was, since I have zero minutes, I'm just going to skip this because this is not still not well uh, uh, understood at this point about this relation uh, to the. But there is some hint that it's also related to uh, some kind of scattering equation that we can formulate. But of course, we need to take the massive states into account uh, properly. So the conclusion, so in this talk, I've talked about the structure of string theory. And I've shown you that the zero really re reveals uh, a way to allow us to project into field theory without doing anything with alpha prime. Right? All I'm doing is just switching the sign signature of my left hand, right hand. So this is more like converting into a Cairo theory. Now, the, 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 so in this, in this, doing it this way, the field theory amplitude is still given by a complete string theory in the sense that you, have to, you still have your world sheet. And we also see that in, in, the, in the previous uh, uh, saddle point equation, you see that the reason why it doesn't have the usual exponential softness, uh, suppression softness, is because this, you have this uh, opposite sign and compared with the left and the right handed. And so this ex exponential softness is actually canceled between the left and the right handedness. Now, in particular, for the, so this is actually only, we're really doing it for the closed string. 
So for type two superstring and heterotic Yang mills, actually this corresponds to a quantum version of the tensionless string. And we can have a direct pathway to, towards the relationship to the usual, to now the scattering equation formula. Now for the heterotic and bosonic gravity, actually we now have massive states with spin two. So actually, so, I mean, so as, you, as some of you know who are, who are interested in the massive uh, spin two particles, there has been a long history of trying to couple massive spin two uh, with uh, gravity. Uh, uh, which was, uh, I think it was more, it was only successfully done five years ago, four or five years ago, according to what I've seen in the literature. But now we see that this actually just falls out from this construction. And even better, we not, that doesn't even just fall, it's not just that we have this, we actually have super symmetric versions of this. So we actually get n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, and n equals four, in four dimensions. So we have a whole class of in, at least consistence in a sense as a field theory consistent uh, interaction of, of massive spin two with massive gravity. And we also have, in this theory, we also have a hint that this must, it can, might be also related to a, some kind of formulation of steel HY. So this should be interesting to study uh, in this direction as well. So, okay, so I'll just stop here. So thank you. Yeah, so, so, uh, so this is something that I didn't talk about, which is, which, uh, is that, uh, because of course, uh, I, one of my collaborators, Warren Siegel, who's been working on double field theory uh, for a while. So actually, so from his point of view, the original construction of, under, of trying to do this is, to under, is that this is related to uh, the double field theory which uh, has, so in the double field theory, you start with your Lagrangian and then, but then in that case, uh, I think at the beginning of this project, at that case, which fields are actually physical fields and which fields are auxiliary because you're, you're, you're first you're just constructing the, the quadratic part and then the cubic part and, and so there was some uh, uh, confusions about that. So, but supposedly this should be that double field theory and we've identified which ones are the, the, the physical fields, as, as I was just telling you, the spectrum. But as you see, I didn't mention any of this in, in my talk, and that's because I think a, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Olaf and uh, Zwiebach, they had another paper that came out. So they really tried to study the double field theory compared, and they claimed that there's some mismatch between their spectrum and, our, and what is seen in, 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 in this spectrum. So yeah, so, but and from my point, uh, but from this point of view, this theory is consistent in the sense that it has a consistent S matrix that it factorizes correctly, so ev everything is fine. So there should, if it's not the double field theory, then there should be a, a Lagrangian that corresponds to this with these degrees of freedom. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, so this is probably, this is related to double field theory, right? So, so this is, yeah, so in a sense, yes, this is related to T-duality. Well, I have one question. Yeah. There's at least one uh, string scattering system which behave like field theory entity, uh, namely closed string scattered to the incentral. Okay. Uh, behave, it behave like field theory entity. Uh, field theory entity, I mean, um, finite number of pole and uh, power law. Right. So I was wondering whether this system relates But you still have the infinite excitations, right? We do have a, a wall sheet, but only fine number of poles. Yes. If we look at the amplitude, but the yeah. fine number of poles. But, so, so I think that the difference is, is that here you actually have a self-contained system. So, so now these massive vertex operators can go in the outside and you still have only these sets of, of states interacting. So this is really just only these sets of states. It doesn't, and I think in your case, I mean, eventually you will see that the, 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 the other massive states will come in to just for the consistency of the, I'm not familiar with the system, so that would be my uh, guess, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just that, yeah, you're taking the minimum, so that means you're, 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 you're in low energy region where all the string states are massive, you just, you just don't see the string states. So th yeah, that's all there is to it, yeah. So, yeah, you're not even observing the higher dimension operators. You're just literally just decoupling all the higher dimension operators as well as, as your mass, yeah. Uh, 